one year since permitless carry. Reading curriculum failures, plus Curtis Hill touts the IWIR poll and more. From the television studios at WFYI, it's Indiana Week in Review for the week ending July 28th, 2023. Indiana Week in Review is made possible by the supporters of Indiana Public Broadcasting Stations. This week, it's been about a year since Indiana removed the requirement for a permit to legally carry a gun for most Hoosiers. Some listeners and viewers were curious about the impact. Indiana Public Broadcasting's Violet Comer Weiland reports on examples from other permitless carry states and preliminary data. It is too early to measure the exact effects of permitless carry in Indiana, but nationwide studies, including a 2022 study from Johns Hopkins, shows a more than 9% increase in assault with firearms than expected over 10 years, as 34 states relax restrictions on carrying firearms in public. Pierre Atlas is a senior lecturer at the Paul H. O'Neill School of Public and Environmental Affairs at IUPUI. He says in Indiana, any legislation that provides less gun regulation will likely lead to more violence. I think that we will find studies that will be a lot more non-fatal shootings, a lot more accidental shootings, a lot more uh, crimes of passion, a lot more fights that end in gun violence that otherwise would not have had. Additional Indianapolis Police Department data shows an increase in non-fatal accidental shootings in the first six months under permitless carry. Does the impact of permitless carry matter in the General Assembly? It's the first question for our Indiana Week in Review panel. Democrat, Lindsey Hake. Republican, Mike O'Brien. John Schwannis, host of Indiana Lawmakers. And Erica Heron, reporter for Axios Indianapolis. I'm Indiana Public Broadcasting Digital Editor Lauren Chapman in this week for Brandon Smith. Lindsey, does the impact of this law matter inside the State House? I don't see how it can't matter. I mean, this is just one of the most significant issues in our day and time and something we will be judged by in how our legislature and our governor handled this. And it's something we have to, have to, have to come back to. This data that's coming out, there's a story out of Fort Wayne earlier this week that showed we had just the amount of, of gun violence. I don't care at this point if it is fatal or non-fatal from a, even from a parental concern. It is a safety concern, and what worries me most is that our legislature heard this concern from our superintendent of, poli of uh, state police mm -hmm. and ignored the conversation. It happened practically in the middle of the night at a very late hearing in February 2022, and he just all of the concerns that he exhibited were just pushed off, and the bill moved forward. Mm -hmm. Michael Bryan, I mean, same question. I mean. Do you think that the effect of this bill or of this legislation is going to make an impact in the state house or does the state house care? Not with this study. I mean, <laughs> th th this was, I mean, if you're, if you're trying to convince the legislature to go revisit that decision, this was pretty, this was a pretty weak first, first attempt. Um, I mean, even the people that were overseeing the study said, we don't really know, but here's what, here's what's happened in the last 10 years at a time when violent, violent gun deaths have been on the rise mm -hmm. everywhere, permitless or not. Um, so, I mean, if you're, if, if you're looking to revisit this conversation in the State House, it's going to have to be a lot more significant. Unfor and, uh, and unfortunately, that means <laughs> that there's, there's going to be a lot more gun violence. And you're going to have to be able to tie a straight line from point A to point B at a time when it's going up everywhere, and especially in urban centers controlled by Democrats. And, and, and in that context, going to a State House controlled overwhelmingly by Republicans is not going to matter. Yeah. I mean, uh, John Schwannis, I kind of talking about that, that the fact that gun violence has gone up pretty much everywhere. Uh, is there or something to the, uh, to the supply of, of, of weapons? And, and more importantly, I think, does it matter to the average Hoosier? Well, we seem to have an ample supply in this country. I, what's the statistic? We have X number of guns for every man, woman, child, and pet dog and cat in, in America. So I don't think that necessarily is, is the issue. And I'm not sure uh, that a study of this type, a scholars, scholarly sort of academic look at trends is necessarily going to shake loose these deeply held views that a lot of conservatives in the General Assembly have. Sadly, what probably would move, uh, bring movement, and you hate to see these kinds of things, would be not the studies, but the headline grabbing tragedies where uh, you know, a police officer uh, has made a stop and because 
he or she was unaware uh, of the circumstances, perhaps gun ownership or uh, possession of the individual being stopped, is gunned down along the, the, the interstate, those types of things, that's what will, uh, because then we talked about the superintendent of the state police and, and his call for uh, to not go this direction. Then all of a sudden the narrative becomes, here's the I told you so, here, here are the tragic effects, you know, the officer who leaves behind a spouse and cute children and you can, you know, the, again, I'm not, nobody's wishing this. No, no. But Nobody but, wants it to happen. But that's but, the catalyst but for that's, this. It's not higher but, ed. But that's what <laughs> right? happens. It's, it's, because keep in mind, as we see the crime trends go up here and elsewhere, the mindset among many in the General Assembly is the old cliche. The best way to deal with bad guys and bad women with guns is to put more guns in the hands of law-abiding citizens. So arguably, in that sort of upside-down perspective, uh, you could say that this means we need to get more guns on the streets, not fewer. Yeah. I mean, Erica, especially in the context of Indianapolis, where uh, we've seen so much gun violence, do you think that, you know, for the average Hoosier who sees this study, do you think that they are putting pressure on the state house to make any changes? Um, they might put pressure on the state house, but I'm not sure. I, I kind of agree, you know, with the others here. That I'm not agree. I'm not sure that's going to have much impact at the state house. Where we're seeing it make an impact is in, you know, local government, right? It's changed the conversation in the mayoral race here in Indianapolis. Republican candidate calling for the repeal of permitless carry in the city. If something like that were to happen, which I don't think it will, um, you know, but if it were, if you know, Jefferson Street becomes mayor and that happens, then that might start to change the conversation because how do you really implement that in just Indianapolis when you have people coming, you know, in and out of the city all the time? Um, so I don't know that it has an impact at the state house, but it might start to have an impact at local levels. Well, what that would do is undoubtedly prompt some in the General Assembly to try to make sure that they have, can't do that that they have done can't what put they've put done with landlord rights and plastic yeah. no bags in grocery red. stores and you <laughs> go right down signals. anything yeah, exactly. arguing we can't have piecemeal uh, laws and, and ordinances and enforcement this is we have to have it in a holistic manner so I think the first step would not be wow that's interesting local control calls it shots it's actually how can we stop that I yeah. also think though that it's really uh, well it's, it's curious how all of a sudden data might be taken into consideration for a conversation at the legislature where we dismiss fact and we dis dismiss logic all, all the time in those, off in those uh, committee hearings. Mm -hmm. Well, time now for viewer feedback. Each week we pose an unscientific online poll question. This week's question, will the Indiana General Assembly ever repeal the law allowing permitless carry of handguns? A yes or B no. Last week's question, does Mike Pence have a realistic shot at the 2024 Republican nomination for president? 7% said yes and 93% said no. If you'd like to take part in the poll, go to wfyi.org slash IWIR and look for the poll. Some of Indiana's top institutions received an F rating on a national report on the effectiveness of the reading curriculum and teacher prep programs. For Indiana Public Broadcasting, Elizabeth Gabriel reports, this includes Indiana University Bloomington and Butler and Ball State Universities. The national study determines which colleges excel at providing a reading science curriculum. That's a science-based way of teaching literacy, which will soon be required in public elementary schools across Indiana. But the only Indiana school that received an a was Marion University in Indianapolis. Eight Indiana colleges received an F rating. Some institutions could have received low scores because they use practices contrary to science-based literacy research, such as 3 queuing. That's when kids use pictures and context clues to guess unfamiliar words instead of relying on their reading knowledge to sound out a word. Beginning in fall 2024, educators will no longer be able to use the three queuing teaching model. Michael Bryan, are we already on our way to solving this problem? Well on our way. Um, and that's because of bipartisan legislation uh, that passed this session. Um, that House Bill uh, 1558, Jake Teshka up north and Aaron Freeman in Indianapolis mm -hmm. with Indianapolis Democrats and a, a pretty broad spectrum of, of legislators who supported investing in this and changing um, how, how reading is taught, yeah. um, adopting this new model, making sure that teachers who are, or prospective teachers, student, uh, students um, who are graduating uh, next year uh, from college with a teaching degree are, are educated in this way. Teachers that have already graduated are already in the classroom, 
Um, they set aside a separate fund to fund um, the training of those teachers. And when they're trained, they get paid more mm -hmm. by law. Um, and so the legislature took s some big steps this session to, uh, to implement you know, the, this new methodology, and, and they did it on a bipartisan basis, so Indiana's addressing the problem well ahead of this study. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. I mean, uh, Lindsay, uh, kind of thinking about it from uh, the perspective of a, of a bipartisan win, I mean, Indiana has had some really concerning statistics about literacy in general over the last couple of years. Is this, you know, a, a way to celebrate some bipartisanship at the State House? I always celebrate bipartisanship, mostly because there's not a lot uh, super majority or super minority aside. It's always better to have a collective uh, group think that uh, benefits Hoosiers. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll say that. However, this is not the only study that came out this week regarding education. We had a lot of information out there. We had an article about how uh, Indiana has failed its school counselors. We had an article that um, also revealed CNBC reporting, uh, uh, polling, or forgive me, reporting that showed that Indiana had a D rating uh, when it comes to education across the board. We've heard repeatedly by teachers at the State House who, again, do not get listened to. This legislature has failed to listen to its experts. Mm -hmm. And we have a scenario where teachers are leaving in droves. We have an employment, uh, we have a huge employment need. Lots of roles are left unfilled. And uh, uh, you're having a scenario where where the ratios are affected in classrooms and so no I don't think this is a, a, a the educational system in Indiana is not at a, at a place where I think it makes me happy at least sure. and I don't think it would make the average Hoosier happy either and doesn't show any of our polling or any of our data doesn't show it either so there's work to do yeah absolutely I mean Erica uh, kind of thinking about the the work that needs to be done mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> this uh, this poll was uh, or, or this study was especially fascinating to me as a graduate of Ball State mm. uh, because it was historically a teacher's college. Yeah. Um, you know, what does that say about uh, Indiana's uh, pipeline for teachers into the classroom that, that our, our schools did so poorly? Well, it says that we have a lot of teachers that are in the classrooms right now that need to be retrained, which as Mike was saying, there's, you know, um, this legislation addresses some of that. But it's going to take a long time to get everybody kind of caught up to these new methods. Um, and it's not just the teachers that we need to address, it's also the students who have already come through, you know, the third grade and didn't get this instruction. So how do we help catch them up too for the lessons that they learned and maybe they were never properly taught in reading. And so how do we help those kids? And I think we're seeing those effects, you know, throughout like later down the education system. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. I mean, John Schwannis, what is the big takeaway that, that Hoosiers across the state should understand about this this study and, and some of the wins that we've seen at the State House for, for addressing that literacy. we should be alarmed because our state is nothing if we sacrifice elementary education. That's the building block and strike up the, the corny music here and the violins because that is the building block for everything. We talk about how important quality of life is in our state. We talk about what makes our state attractive to investors uh, and business owners who, that may want to expand or start operations here and offer those wonderful high paying jobs that uh, often show up in news releases from the economic development folks. You can't do that if you don't have a solid foundation. What's interesting here is it seems that every conversation we've had that's related to bad news in education in the past few years has had the asterisk that it's COVID related. Mm -hmm. This is interesting in that this is much more about methods. This is about how teaching is done, not about whether it was in-person in instruction or whether it was done, you know, via, you know, a, a balky uh, internet service yeah. provider and with, with bad connection. So in a way, it's refreshing uh, to say, hey, let's get back to the basics of teaching, reading, <laughs> writing, and arithmetic, and not focus on this sort of cloud that's been hanging over our educational heads now for three, four years. Yeah. Well, uh, moving on, Curtis Hill's gubernatorial campaign this week celebrated his victory in the recent Indiana Week in Review unscientific poll about who should be the Republican candidate for governor in 2024. Hill's campaign touted the results as the first third-party poll since he joined the race. The release from the former attorney general, whose law license was temporarily suspended while he was in office because he criminally battered four women, said the results showed that Hoosiers want a proven conservative. In the survey, 44% of respondents said Hill should be the GOP nominee. That's compared to 23% for Lieutenant Governor Suzanne Crouch, 9% for Fort Wayne businessman Eric Doden, 6% for U.S. Senator Mike Braun, and 19% for the option, someone else. 
The poll is not scientific in any way. Anyone can vote regardless of where they live. There are ways to vote multiple times, and while the poll normally garners around 200 to 250 responses each week, last week's had more than double that. John Schwanis, what do you make of this particular campaign strategy? Well, <laughs> <laughs> let's just say the viewers of this show, it's the smartest group in the, in the state of Indiana. These are policy wonks and they're smart people, so I, I think people should heed their interests and preferences. But the fact that there was such a spike in participation and such a lopsided outcome suggests that there was some uh, sincere and uh, intentional attempt here to, to drum up business. Whether that has an effect or not, I guess you can put it in a fundraising letter and say, hey, we're, we're on a, number one in a poll. Now, you can kind of bury in the fine print that yeah. it's not really a poll. It's, <laughs> it's uh, kind of just, a, well, it's not even a poll. Uh, and so uh, that's one takeaway. It's a little activity. I An activity. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess from a standpoint of grassroots organizing or finger dexterity, those are both uh, good things. Um, so, uh, and I would just, the other observation I would have is, you know, we have the question for next week about Mike Pence, mm -hmm. or that was last week's. Yeah, uh, that was last, last week's. week's yeah. It's weeks already. Right. Yeah. I don't think he had the same consultant who emphasized. 7% pop. No, I, I, think this, I think this, I think that consultant needs to go. <laughs> and this one can get some new make hay yeah. with uh, doing all things uh, IWIR polling. <laughs> so. I mean, Erica, I, does this signal uh, a little bit of nervousness from the, the uh, a former attorney general's campaign? Is it more just a little bit of a one-off that's sometimes a little bit goofy? I'm not sure it signals much of anything yeah. um, other than looking for good news where you can find it and maybe some effective you know campaigning there and getting people to come out and, and vote in the poll for you yeah. he's the newest you know to join the, the the race so maybe just looking for an early win to get people talking about him which we are that's absolutely fair I mean uh, Lindsay I, <laughs> I think we've all been well at least Mike and I've been on mm -hmm. a number of campaigns that's that's you know what we do I've and never manipulated the outcome of a week in review poll. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 do want to say that. I think uh, <laughs> I think that's that's a unprecedented uh -huh. uh, tactic I, I think that's accurate but this to me just reeks desperation right mm -hmm. and so and this is not the only it's unscientific poll <laughs> that uh, that Curtis Hill has done this with. He was also featuring on his social media earlier another fake poll uh, from a very uncreditable, uh, creditable, um, uh, I'm not even going to call it a news source, mm -hmm. uh, that he also is featuring. And so this just reeks of desperation. It's an unserious candidate with unserious tactics and an unserious strategy, and I, I think it should be, be dismissed. Yeah. I mean, Mike, do you think that this is... is uh, indicative of Curtis Hill being an unserious candidate, or is this just one of those goofy things that happens? I think, no, I, I'm with Eric. I think the um, you're looking for good news where you can find it and, and promote it, right? But I don't know. I've been on the show 300 times. <laughs> I don't. The, I, don't, I can't remember a single time where, and Curtis is, Hill's taken the outcome as proof that Hoosiers want a conservative, mm -hmm. true conservative. The Indiana Week in Review poll, because of our left-leaning audience, who we love has never proven, the outcome of which has never proven this audience wants anything resembling a conservative 7% Mike Pence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, wait, how, you how say our done? audience is left-leaning. You <laughs> suggested they're desperate. there's desperation in the air. Let's go back to, we have the smartest wait, audience. Wait, hold on, hold on. I am an audience expert. Very small. And I, I can't tell you, yeah, it's actually, a, it's not, uh, it's actually a remarkably balanced uh, audience, that there's a lot of Republican support for public media in Indiana, also a lot of Democrats, like, you know, there's a reason why I have a Nina Toten bag. Um, it, yes, but that being said, like, you know, this, the poll ends up being a little, it's still entirely unscientific, and I do need to say that. And as a digital, as a data professional, it is an unscientific poll. That being but said. But if there were an underwriter who wanted to underwrite the poll, <laughs> it would still be a very valid use of funds. I mean, absolutely. Okay, yeah. all right. I think the desperation, too, I just want to make sure I'm clear here. <laughs> yes, the desperation absolutely. was the tactic, not not the, the, yes, act, yes, 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 absolutely, absolutely. So now take back left leaning. We'll be, we'll be okay. <laughs> take it back. Take it back. That poll has never been balanced. It? <laughs> it has not. Maybe we have a left leaning poll taking. I think we, that, that, we, that makes more sense. Oh, yes. Left yes. leaning. Yeah. 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 yeah, the digital please, audience. Please question the process. Yes, yes. There yes. We, that tracks. Uh, the ACLU of Indiana is suing an Indiana sheriff over claims he silenced critics on a government-run Facebook page. 
The lawsuit in federal court accuses Henry County Sheriff John Sprawls of blocking accounts and deleting critical comments. The suit claims these actions represent viewpoint-based discrimination and violate the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. The ACLU filed the suit on behalf of a podcaster named Christopher Bilbrey, whose comments were deleted from the sheriff's page. In an email last week, Sprawls said he was unaware of the lawsuit. Erica, I mean, does the law need to more fully grapple with social media? I don't know if the law does so much as the people who work in our municipal government offices need to. Uh, we need to make sure folks are properly trained on what the you know, policies and procedures need to be here. There is some question there. I mean, courts have ruled different ways on this. They tend to rule that you're not supposed to you know, uh, delete comments or block people, although there have been other decisions. The Seventh Circuit hasn't ruled on this, so I mean, it's not fully settled, but I think it's more just a, a training in, in local offices that probably is, would solve this problem. Yeah. I mean, uh, John, it does it, how much do you think that state government specifically needs to, to you know, address social media? I mean, I, I know from my perspective as a digital editor that, like, you know, for, for journalists, we have a habit of, you know, not deleting tweets, being, you know, responsible to, to that. I, I don't know how, how government offices have, have really fallen down between this is an official communication method and this is just a way of communicating information. They probably have they have their hands full with tick, the battle against TikTok sure. uh, <laughs> for other security reasons and, and lucivious uh, content. But let's just say uh, probably best that the General Assembly focus maybe on education and uh, with the sort of public access counselor uh, and that sort of uh, information because we're already so muddled. You know, we have a public that's trying to get Congress to weigh in on on the providers like, uh, you know, the Facebooks and others or, or in the old days even uh, Twitter. And, uh, you know, you can and can't do this. Confusing what is a privately run entity as if it were a billboard company or a newspaper that's privately held versus something in this case, which is the issue isn't who owns the, the, the infrastructure, the platform. It's what that site is. And, and it is ostensibly, by all accounts, a public site. And that does make it different. But it's just so muddled now, as we've seen from the last election, where these companies were unfair to Donald Trump, so we need to police, you know, they can't take down certain things. And then you get into whole property rights issues, and then all of a sudden people on the right start swerving into the left lane, and people on the left, and it all gets very confusing. Yeah. It just seems uh, like a complicated issue to, uh, to even attempt to tackle. I mean, Mike, what is your perspective on this? It's like, not the legislature's job. I mean, if Congress wants to come in and do this, he's, it's so muddled and confusing. I'm with John. It's, okay, well, I own the page, and I don't make, what if someone puts something anti-Semitic on that page and I delete it? Okay, well, now we have a whole different conversation about, okay, well, people support that. Well, they, but they didn't support when, I was, when someone was being critical of me, and I, and I deleted that. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I don't know what it is about Facebook that when you log into it, all common sense is suspended for that period of <laughs> yeah, time. Yeah, there's actually a study but about let's, that. But let's get back to, morning. we'll just log out and walk away. Yeah, <laughs> <no>. Forever. <laughs> I do hear that LSA has been drafting legislation dealing with MySpace, and it's been in the works for years, and I think they're this close to getting that out there. Because we're sort of, we'd like to see how other states and develop yeah. and unfold. So we'll, we're going to tackle MySpace first. Oh. The data that I was talking about came from the UT Austin this morning that revealed oh. during a study having to do with Facebook specifically mm -hmm. during the 2020 election it was mm -hmm. it literally made people more partisan mm -hmm. and that was just uh, to go to a good government uh, slant on this as you were saying how do we attempt to even have the conversation at the legislature the legislature has never been really friendly to any type of public governance when it comes to records or when it comes to like for example the legislature exempted themselves from from apra yes. and you you have hoosiers who literally cannot have an open door into their state house there's reasons that's not got gotten good grades when it comes to open government mm -hmm. so i worry that if we start having that conversation at the legislature that it could flex into being a very um closed closed out of doors. That makes sense. I mean, it's hard to take it seriously. It's hard to take it not seriously as well. Wow. That's right. Well, speaking of something that's entirely unserious, finally, <laughs> this week marks the start of the 2023 Indiana State Fair. So, of course, it's also time to marvel at some of the foods. This year, new options include brachos, that is bratwurst nachos, deep fried corn on a stick, street corn pizza, and s'mores funnel cake. Mike O'Brien, what's your go-to fair food? 
I'm like a roasted ear of corn guy. I don't want it Absolutely. dipped in chocolate. I don't want it covered yes, in sprinkles. Yes. I want it covered in butter and salt and it has let's, to be it has to be 100 degrees outside. Well, you have to, to have it dunked. <laughs> yeah, you have to have it dunked in butter. That's the only way to enjoy roasted corn. <laughs> well, my kids will love the rest of it. If you exactly. pair that with a good Indiana beer, I'm with you. Yeah. Basic mm -hmm. and good, mm -hmm. and maybe some cotton candy to finish it off. Yes. Mm -hmm. Beer yes. and cotton candy. Oh, oh yeah. 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 You wow. clearly, do you have children? <laughs> yeah, but come on, you gotta well, have. You're, you're going to be they, out 40 bucks for the cotton candy. You might as well get your I was going to say something. Like, I was going to go to the dairy barn <laughs> okay. and get my chocolate milkshake. Whether it's before or after or, my ribeye I mean, steak, I'm not sure. 100 but, degree yeah. day Sounds like a campaigning. Erica, yeah, right. I'm more excited. What are you looking forward to at the State Fair food? Yeah, well, I write a meatless, uh, meat-free food column Who's each week. So I'm going right. today to try all the different meatless options. So I'm going to try. There's a new... Uh, the deep fried corn on a stick. I feel like I've got to try that for the readers and see what else There's I no find. meat in a s'mores funnel. <laughs> <laughs> no meat in a s'mores funnel. More cotton candy and beer. And Her that's favorite. Indiana Week in <laughs> Review for this week. Our panel is Democrat Lindsey Hake, Republican Mike O'Brien, John Schwanis of Indiana Lawmakers, and Erica Heron of Axios Indianapolis. You can find Indiana in Week in Review's podcast and episodes at wfyi.org slash iwir or on the PBS app. I'm Lauren Chapman of Indiana Public Broadcasting. Join us next time because a lot can happen in an Indiana week. The opinions expressed are solely those of the panelists. Indiana Week in Review is a WFYI production in association with Indiana's public broadcasting stations.